Welcome to the airspace business model. Our government is a constitutional and federal government that employs a representative democracy. It supports a capitalistic economic structure that includes private ownership of the means of production, creation of goods or services for profit or income, the accumulation of capital, competitive markets, voluntary exchange, and wage labor. We can participate in managerial decisions, travel freely, buy and sell freely, hire and fire freely, organize, communicate, demonstrate, and protest freely. What we really are, however, is a mixed economy. In our economy, there are tax-funded, subsidized, or state-owned enterprises such as libraries, roads, transportation services, schools, some hospitals, some banks, mail services, communication services, water systems, legal assistance, and research and development. There is some autonomy over personal finances, but we're taxed for services like welfare for the poor, social security for the aged and infirmed, business subsidies, and mandatory insurance. In our government, we also have environmental regulation, labor regulation, consumer regulation, antitrust laws, intellectual property laws, incorporation laws, import and export controls. What part of the government did I leave out? Defense, foreign relations, and foreign intelligence. Adam Smith was a proponent of capitalism. Karl Marx was a proponent of socialism. For the most part, we've adopted a capitalistic system. Whether you're a capitalist or not, our commander-in-chief, chief executive, and head of state is a capitalist. We are customers who are part of the public sector and as such a mission focus. We hire out contractors who are part of the private sector and as such a profit focus. This creates potential conflicts of interest. This is not insurmountable, but you'll find the cultures are different and the attitudes are different. I don't know who decided to outsource the work that we do to private industry. Some agencies that are involved with what we do build satellites themselves. While you may argue that outsourcing to private companies is inefficient, it's the model that was adopted when this office was founded. This could change in the future, but for now these private companies are our partners. The purpose of this course is to give the exposure to what motivates people within corporations so that you can better understand some of their behaviors. The companies I want to focus on are major aerospace firms. Here's a list of names, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing, and these are the big three. Raytheon, General Dynamics, L3 Communications, Orbital Sciences, Rockwell Collins, and United Technologies. They provide tremendous support and expertise. They're, what I won't talk about is federally funded research and develop company, development companies. Their financial and business model is fundamentally different from companies in the public sector. I will also not talk about for-profit companies that provide pers personnel who support the government directly. This presentation focuses on for-profit corporations who develop hardware and software. The big three are Northrop Grumman Corporation, who operates in several main sectors. It's a leading maker of airborne systems, a designer of electronic warfare systems, makes space systems, and provides advanced information systems. It spun off its shipbuilding segment in March of 2011, and prior to that acquired Linton Industry and Newport News in 2001 and TRW in 2002. Lockheed Martin Corporation provides a broad range of products and services to the world's governments and commercial customers. Areas of concentration include space and missile systems, electronics, aeronautics, and information systems. Their program base includes the F-16, F-22, and F-35 aircraft, ballistic and other missile systems, C-130 military transport, and Titan launch vehicles. The Boeing Company is a leading manufacturer of commercial jet aircraft. It manufactures the 737, 747, 767, 777, and 787. It also produces business jets, fighters, the F-15 and F-A-18, C-17 car cargo carrier, V-22 helicopter, E-3 AWACS, E-4 command post, E-6 submarine communicator, ground transportation systems, and develops the space station. It also does work on the F-22. For, for you to understand how these companies operate, we have to start with fundamental business models. We outsource to publicly held corporations whose business model is very different from a typical for-profit corporation. Next, I'll talk about the aerospace business model. It's a bit different and distinct from fundamental business model. Then I'll talk about what primarily, primarily motivates a corporation. In essence, 
is shareholder value. There's several components of shareholder value, and I'll explain them in the second part. Every company has intrinsic value, and usually there's a correlation between a company's intrinsic value and shareholder value. I'll explain some of the aspects of intrinsic value when I describe the income statement. I'll talk about the revenue breakdown. I'll talk about the corporate structure at lower levels and what I believe motivates them. I'll talk about a case study, DirecTV, and then I'll wrap up. To understand how aerospace developers operate, we first have to go over some of the basics of corporate business models. The most obvious business model is a product model. This is where a corporation will invest money, non-recurring investments, in development, will produce a product, and hopefully sell it at a profit. And here I show non-recurring product development. Companies will set a product price and spend money to produce the product. The difference between their non-recurring development costs and production costs and the product price is their profit margin. In this business model, if they produce more products, that non-recurring product development cost is amortized over a larger number of product. And amortized just means the costs are allocated to products produced. In a model like this, profit margins increase because that non-recurring product development cost is spread over a broader base. What can also happen is money is spent to develop a product, money is spent to produce the product, and then companies find ways to make the product cheaper. The non-recurring development costs are amortized over the broader base, but also because production costs have been decreased, profit margins increase. What happens more often than not, however, is market forces drive prices down, so product margins decrease. And that's what I've shown here. Products govern cycles. A phase of development is followed by product sales. In the best case, a company will capitalize on prior year sales and increase their market or market share with each successive versions. Product cycles are typically yearly. That means that a product company must be continually reinvesting in order to stay competitive. This is an example of a disruptive technology. At the start, the primary producer dominates, and at the same time, there's an upstart who enters the market. The upstart doesn't appear to be much of a threat, and so the product company continues with its typical, typical product cycle. For a, a disruptive technology, it takes over the market at some point and overwhelms the competition. There's a good book that describes this, The Innovator Dilemma, Innovator's Dilemma. In it, they talk about two examples of where companies had developed hard disk drive technology. Upstars developed smaller format hard disk drives. The primary companies were focused on their customers and introducing new features that the customers wanted, but the upstarts were making a better and faster and cheaper product. And they overcame their competition and literally put them out of business. The cycle happened again, where a new round of small format disk drive technologies were developed, and those upstarts took over the market and put the second companies out of business. Suffice it to say that product development is a very competitive business. Most products that go to market don't make a profit, and some of them aren't intended to make a profit. They're introduced as lost leaders. The risks are high and the payoff isn't certain. Here are examples of product companies. Mattel make to makes toys, Ford makes cars, Intel chips, and Microsoft software. The other kind of business model is a service model. Here an infrastructure is built up. This takes substantial investment and the barriers for entry are high. Startup costs for a company like DirecTV were on the order of a billion dollars. Once in place, subscribers can be signed up. So what a company will do is set a service price, spend money to sign up subscribers, and the difference between their non-recurring development costs and subscriber acquisition costs and their service price is their profit. As they gain more subscribers, they can amortize that infrastructure development cost over a broader base, and their profit margins increase. In the service business, unlike the product business, Prices tend to go up, which means profit margins tend to increase. 
Service companies can innovate, but their options are limited because of the large upfront investment in the fundamental infrastructure. Smaller incremental investments offer improvements, but unlike a product company, they are much more limited. Here it's much more difficult for a disruptive technology to take over. That wasn't the case, however, with DirecTV. Large cable companies were providing the primary service and had most of the subscribers. When DirecTV entered the market, they offered a better service with better quality at a comparable price. And over time, they took away significant market share from cable companies. Examples of server com service companies are Cox Communications, Verizon Networks, AT&T, and DirecTV. Any company that you're paying a monthly fee to is likely a service company. A lesser known business model is intellectual property. Here one invents something and licenses it to others. The margins are very high because the overhead costs are minimal and upfront costs can be minimal as well. So here you spend non-recurring development, research and development money to develop an invention. You set a license fee and then you pay very minimal licensing costs to put licenses in place with companies that, that are going to use that technology. The profit margins here can be quite significant. Most companies, including the ones we work with, have small divisions who fund patent development and then license their intellectual property outside companies. This can be a very lucrative business. Here are examples of licensing firms. The Motion Picture Experts Group owns the intellectual property for video compression. The ATSC owns the intellectual property for on-air television broadcasts. Coca-Cola is an interesting example. You usually think of them as a bottling company. Many years ago, they spend their bottling company operations into separate companies. They since bought back their North American bottling operation, but otherwise bottling is done separately. They've primarily licensed the formula for Coke to other and other products to bottlers. They did this to preserve the low margin part of the business in a separate company. That's why Warren Buffett was interested in buying them and still owns about 9%. I'd mentioned Microsoft as a product company, but in reality, they would be more than happy to have you download software off the, the internet and you're fundamentally paying for the end user license agreement. So in essence, Microsoft is an extremely low margin licensing company, much like these others. The other kind of business model is financial services. Some of this is a typical service model, but the vast majority of what financial service companies do is retain and invest money. They're leveraging the principle of compound interest. So they make money with money. Examples are Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, which is primarily an insurance company. He owns Geico, an insurance company, State Farm Insurance, Morgan Stanley Financial Services, and Bank of America, which is a bank. The companies we work with do some of this as well. They tend not to have significant amounts of cash on hand like these companies, but they do have a lot of people who focus on cash management, both to ensure that they're getting competitive interest rates on their debt, competitive interest rates on their cash on hand, and that their cash flow is managed well. In summary, here are the typical business models. Product model, a service model, intellectual property, financial services, and next I'll talk about the aerospace business model. This is the model that's focused on government contracting, and this is where we'll start. Let's start with the government contracting structure. Government contracts come in three forms, firm fixed price, cost plus, and time and materials. I'm not going to cover the latter because for the companies we're focused on, it's not a significant part of their business. There are four types of firm fixed price contract models. The classic one is a simple firm fixed price contract, but they can have but they can have provisions for award fee, incentive fee, or even an economic price adjustment. So on a firm fixed price contract, the award fee component is a portion of profit that is awarded by the government based on a subjective assessment and criteria that are set quarterly. Incentive fee is 
define when the contract's put in place. So it's an a priori formula, and it's a portion of profit that is paid based on incentive criteria. For a fixed price with economic price adjustment is typically something done in the commercial world, not so much in the government world, but it allows the firm fixed price to be adjusted based on a change in interest rates or other factors. There are also four types of cost plus contract models. The classic one is cost plus award fee, but can include incentive fee, fixed fee, and a fee based on cost concern, cost incurred, excuse me. This latter part is not allowed by the federal government. With cost plus, the fee pools are separate. When the contract's negotiated, the cost of the contracts are determined and a target is put in place and the fee pool is set aside separately. In a cost plus contract, if the contractor underruns, the government pays less money. If the contractor overruns, the government pays more money. Typically, with cost plus, the government must hold reserve in case there are overruns. And with firm fixed price, the contractor holds their own reserves. These contracts allocate risk to either the customer or the buyer or to the seller or the contractor. Because firm fixed price offers the most limited exposure for the customer, the, the customer bears the least risk. Going in order as the contract types change, the customer bears more risk. With cost plus fixed fee, the customer bears all the risk. On the other hand, if the contractor enter in, enters into a firm fixed price award fee contract, they're taking on a very high level of risk. Likewise, if they negotiate a cost plus fixed fee contract, they have very little financial risk. This illustrates why there's risk for one party or the other. In a firm fixed price contract, as the, the profit is whatever's left over after costs are, in, are accounted for. If the contractor overruns, they must bear the burden of the additional cost. If costs go up, their profits decrease. And if costs exceed the firm fixed price value, they incur a loss and can incur a significant loss if costs go up significantly. With cost plus, if the contractor underruns, the customer benefits. But if the contract and if the contractor comes in on costs, the customer pays those costs. If the contractor overruns, they're made whole. The customer always pays. The fee or profit is set up in a separate pool. In an award or incentive fee situation, incentive fee situation, the contractor may earn no fee if they overrun, but they never face the possibility of a financial loss. We typically use cost plus contract structures when the development is very risky. If we were to ask for a firm fixed price proposal for a risky development, most contractors would decline to bid. For a firm fixed price contract, the contractor has a big incentive to lower costs because that will maximize profits. A cost plus contract is different. The incentive is to bring the costs in almost exactly at the target value and at the same time earn the maximum fee. Because the fee is separate, there is no penalty for incurring costs to the target value. The motive behind this is overhead costs and I'll explain that later. This is fundamentally why contractors not, are not incentivized to underrun. Given these two fundamental contract types, which, bottle, which business model do you think applies? In the firm fixed price case, it's pretty obvious. It's a product model. In our case, a firm fixed price contract pays for a satellite product. Once delivered, we pay, and we pay a fixed amount. With a cost plus model, it's a bit more difficult to say. Ask yourself, how do these contractors get paid on a cost plus contract? The answer is they do so by filling out time cards and getting reimbursed for material costs. Most of the costs are labor. This is essentially a technical services model. This is a typical program profile. It starts with requirements development, then preliminary design, critical design, fabrication, integration and test, delivery, launch, and mission operations. Costs usually peak at the CDR timeframe and then tail off. From a customer perspective, We'd like to defer any fee until we get the actual satellite delivered. From a contractor perspective, however, if they earn profits later, they must account for the time value of money. And the time value of money is quantified by this equation. 
The future value equals the present value times one plus the rate of return to the power of the number of periods. So money in the future, money in the present is worth more than money in the future. If you defer fee, the contractor is going to want more fee paid. What ends up occurring is that we, the customer, end up paying out most of the profit well before a satellite's ever launched. This also confirms that we're essentially paying for technical services. This is a typical fee profile, and contractors usually like it to mirror their program costs. One of the things that is important for them is something I'll talk about in a minute, profit margin. It's essentially the profit earned but divided by the revenue earned. If you spread the fee differently from the anticipated revenue, the profit margin will vary quarter to quarter. Fee, as you know, is not always 100%, and that's depicted by this green line. It varies from period to period. What contractor, contractors are allowed to do is bill for a nominal fee, which is depicted by the red line, and this is what they report out as profits. If, after time, they have billed for more fee than they have earned, which means the green line goes below the red line, they have to give money back. If they've earned more fee than they build, which is when the green line goes above the red line, they can bill for more. This is a legal way for them to smooth out their earnings and something that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got in trouble for, but they're allowed to do. It used to be that the large aerospace companies we deal with favored cost plus contracts over firm fixed price. This has changed in the past five years. Northrop Grumman, as an example, earns 45% of its revenues from fur fixed price contracts and 55% from cost plus. They've taken on more risk for the opportunity to earn more profit. Other business models these contractors engaged in that I've mentioned are intellectual property and financial services. So there's really three ways they earn profits on contracts, by managing a patent portfolio, and by managing their money. That describes the basic aerospace business model. Now I want to talk about how the corporation operates, and first about, I'll talk about how they're structured. Companies are made up of, made up of individuals in various roles. It starts with employees who are concerned with individual performance, managers who manage employees, that are, and they're concerned with group performance. Directors are concerned with unit performance. Vice presidents are concerned with sector performance, and they have responsibility for profit, loss, and sales. The president is responsible for the entire company's profit, loss, and sales. The chief executive officer, who's concerned with corporate performance, chairman of the board is concerned with shareholder value as well as corporate performance. On the top, there's the board of directors that is accountable to shareholders, and then shareholders on the top. This structure is a notional structure, a notional structure. Many companies use different titles for people at these various levels, but suffice it, suffice it to say every company has levels like these. In order to understand internal motivations within these companies, let's start at the top with shareholders. They are the owners of the company. The companies we're dealing with are publicly traded and any of us could buy stock in them. If you were to own all the stock of the company, you'd own the company. The shareholders meet yearly. If you own any amount of stock, you're invited to go. Every year they elect a board of directors, and that includes electing the chairman of the board. While many shareholders do not take this too seriously, majority share shareholders who might own a significant stake of a company do. The board of directors is headed up by the chairman of the board. Sometimes this is one person. Within the company, the chairman of the board is accountable to the shareholders of the company. Why do, we have, why do we have shareholders and why do companies go public? Typically, when companies start up, they need capital, which is money. Early investors might be the founders, investors, or venture capitalists. They'll raise money either from people's personal wealth, angels, investors, venture capital to start their business. As the business starts to grow, typically companies need more capital to fund growth. And in the first few rounds, I'll get this from the private market. There can be as many as four tiers of investment. And each time as these investments are made, the founders of the company are giving up equity in the company. The later rounds of funding typically come from venture capital or strategic alliances. 
companies could borrow money from banks to grow their business, but if you borrow money, you have to pay interest, and you've got to pay interest right away. If you take an investment from a company, you give up equity, but you don't have to pay interest. At some point, when the company is viable and profitable, the founders of the company want to recoup some of the investment they've made. And so they'll offer their stock on public markets in an, in an initial public offering. When companies are owned privately, and many companies still are, um, it's very hard to buy and sell stock. But after an IPO, stock is then offered and available for trade on public markets, which are set up to keep um, a trading liquid. So in a public market, if you own, say, Microsoft or Apple, you can execute a trade on that stock within seconds. In the private market, you'd, act, private market, you'd actually have to find somebody who would buy your stock, and it's much more difficult. So who owns the big companies that we deal with? Boeing is 0.6% owned by officers and directors. State Street Bank and Trust owns 11.4%, which is a pretty big stake. Evercore Trust, 6.9% and Capital World Investors, 9.1%. Lockheed Martin is about 1% owned by offices and directors, 18% owned by State Street Bank and Trust, 11.4% owned by Capital World Investors, and 5% owned by BlackRock. Northrop Grumman is 1.5% owned by officers and directors, 11% owned by State Street Bank and Trust, 10% owned by BlackRock, and 5% owned by the Vanguard Group. The chairman of the board is selected by shareholders and has authority over the board of directors. And their primary focus is shareholder value, which I want to talk about next. So next I want to talk about what drives shareholder value. The factors that I'm about to describe have the greatest influence on the corporation. It starts with stock price, and that's fundamentally affected by market momentum. Here's the stock price of Northrop Grumman over the last three years. And you can see, starting in early 2013, they've had a pretty good run. Lockheed Martin has had similar results. Boeing has as well, although 2014 has been pretty flat for Boeing. Here's the S&P 500 average. It's a collection of 500 stocks and is a pretty good metric of the overall market. And you can see the stock prices have done pretty well in 2013 and 14. Here's the S&P since 1983. So one of the things that drives stock value is market momentum. When investors feel good about the market, they buy more stocks. When they feel bad about the market, they buy less stocks. Market momentum is supposed to be based on fundamentals. And I'll talk about the fundamentals next. But there is something that does drive stock prices, um, there are sheer market forces that drive stock prices. Here are Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and Lockheed all plotted together from 2012 to 2014. So how can these companies influence market momentum? Well, one thing they do is they spend a lot of time talking to Wall Street. A CEO could spend easily a third of their time talking to Wall Street analysts, talking to the institutional investors that have major stakes in their companies, or even institutional investors that are considering buying their companies. Uh, companies invest a lot of uh, time and effort into holding shareholder meetings. They produce pretty nice, fancy, glossy annual reports. Um, they have a requirement, since they're publicly held, to disclose information publicly that is um, – substantial to their company, but they also disclose information publicly in order to attract investors. So there's a lot they can do to influence their stock and even advertising on stations like PBS many times is focused on investors. So one of the fundamental metrics that investors look at are the number of shares outstanding. And this is the total number of shares available for purchase on the market. So here's Northrop Grumman. And they peaked at just below 400 million shares outstanding. They're now down close to 200. If the shares outstanding goes down and the market value stays the same, the average share price will have to go up. 
This is not a hard and fast rule, but it's generally true, and it kind of adheres to the economic supply and demand principle. You can see Northrop Grumman total shares outstanding have been declining. Why did that happen? Well, they used profits to buy back stock. It's a very shareholder-friendly thing to do. And if you're a company that doesn't know what else to do with profits, it's the best thing to do. The reason why the number of shares went up in the early 2000 time frame is because the company, Northrop Grumman, was acquiring other companies. And so as they acquired those other companies, they mixed the shares, and then the total number of shares went up. But starting in 2002, and especially when they spun off their shipbuilding business, the number of shares outstanding decreased. Lockheed Martin has been doing much the same thing, buying back stock to reduce the number of shares outstanding. And Boeing has to some extent as well. And here are all three compared. And you can, you can see in general, all three companies try to buy back shares. Market capitalization is essentially the price you'd have to pay to buy all the stock. Now, if you really started buying all the stock on the open market, the price would sty skyrocket. But hypothetically, the market cap is the share price times the number of shares outstanding, which is what you'd have to pay to buy the company. It is considered what the market believes the company is worth. Here's the market capitalization of Northrop Grumman, and you can see as its stock price increases, its market cap increased, and it's actually doubled in value over the past three years. Likewise, Lockheed Martin has doubled in value as well. So if you bought Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman stock in 2012, you've doubled your money. Boeing, since they're a larger company, has nearly doubled in value but since they're bigger, their market cap uh, doesn't increase as much. But you can see in early 2014, the market valued Boeing at $100 billion. And here's all three. So Northrop Grumman sits at about $30 billion. Lockheed Martin sits at about $60 billion. And Boeing ranges between $90 and $100 billion. Pretty large companies. Here are the market caps of the major aerospace companies that we deal with. And you can see Boeing and United Technologies are by far the largest. Lockheed Martin General Dynamics are next. Raytheon and Northrop Grumman are comparable. L3Com, Rockwell Collins, and BE Aerospace are around $10 billion. And then Orbital Sciences is pretty small. The next metric is net sales. So if you're a company in business, you want to have sales. And sales is income a company receives from its normal business activities, or it's the sale of goods and services to customers. In these graphs, I've ordered these companies based on their sales. So you can see Boeing has the largest number of sales, and it's almost $90 billion. United Technologies is somewhere between 60 and $70 billion. Then Lockheed Martin, General, Dynam General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman and Raytheon are about equal at about $25 billion. And then L3Com, Rockwell Collins, BE Aerospace, and Orbital. Here's Northrop Grumman's annual revenue. They took a dip in 2011 because they spun off their shipbuilding business. But in general, over the last three years, despite the fact that the stock price has gone up, revenues have been declining. Lockheed Martin has had a pretty good run of increases in annual revenue, although they too saw a decline in 2013. Boeing, because they make commercial aircraft, is a bit more volatile business. And lately they've seen revenues increase quite significantly. And here's how all three compare. You can see Northrop Grumman makes significantly less revenue than Lockheed, and Lockheed significantly less than Boeing. Boeing is a much bigger company. Here I want to show you market cap and revenue on the same graph. And you can see something odd. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between the revenue a company earns and its market capitalization. So there's some other metric that Wall Street is using to value companies, and it doesn't appear to be sheer revenue. So revenue is great. It's one measure of a company in any case, how large a company is in terms of net sales. But what is equally or sometimes more important is profits. Companies that don't make a profit don't stay in business too long. Oddly enough, they can stay in business for a long time, but at some point, they go out of business. 
Profit is um, earnings after expenses. And here are the profits of all the major aerospace companies. You can see actually Boeing, despite the fact that they have larger revenues, made less total profit than United Technologies. Lockheed Martin is next, then General Dynamics. Northrop Grumman and Raytheon make about the same profit, even though Northrop Grumman has higher revenues. And then L3Com, Rockwell Collins, BE Aerospace, and then Orbital. Here's Northrop Grumman's annual earnings. You can see since 2003, they had a pretty good increase, took a dip in 2008, and since then have increased fairly steadily. Lockheed Martin even, even more so. They also took a hit in 2010, but since then have been increasing quite steadily. Boeing took quite a significant hit in 2008, 2009. That's because they're in the commercial aircraft business. But increases have been quite substantial from 2010 on. And here's how all three companies compare. And you can see in 2013, Boeing makes a significant, significant profits, uh, followed by Lockheed Martin, followed by Northrop Grumman. Here I'm comparing market cap and net profit. And you can see here, there seems to be a bit more of a correlation. The company valuations, which is the market cap, um, seem to correlate better with profits, which makes more sense. Cash flow is the movement of money in or out of a business, project, or financial product. It's usually measured during a specific finite period of time, and in this case, it's a year. Measurement of cash flow can be used for calculating other parameters that give information on a company's value and situation. The total net cash flow of a company over a period is equal to the change in cash balance over this period. Positive if the cash balance increases, negative if the cash balance decreases. Total net cash flow is the sum of cash flows that are classified in three areas. There's operational cash flows, investment cash flows, and financing cash flows. The bottom line tells investors how much money a company made or lost over a specified time period. However, reported earnings can be affected by accounting methods and don't indicate how much cash a company is generating. Some expenses such as depreciation and amortization reduce corporate profits but do not affect cash flow. Cash flow per share is defined as earnings per share plus depreciation and amortization per share. For many companies, this is a good approximation of actual cash flow. But some items, most notably deferred taxes and investment tax credits, are included in a company's true cash flow, but not in the actual definition. Here I show Northrop Grumman's earnings versus cash flow. A cash flow metric is good for a company that is starting up and has no profits. And it's a good way to assess how healthy the company is and whether they will be profitable in the future. For these large aerospace companies, cash flows and earnings are greater than cash flow, but cash flow and earnings tend to correlate. Profit margin is net profits or income divided by net sales. The measure is used to compare companies of different sizes. Larger companies tend to make larger profits in terms of raw dollars. Their profit margins, however, tend to be lower than smaller companies. And the profit margin is a way to normalize the profits earned by bigger or smaller companies. This measure is, is, is essentially the return on investment of a company. If you were to buy a company, this is the percentage of return you'd get every year. And you can see Boeing, their profit margins are lower than United Technology. Lockheed Martin is lower than UT, but higher than Boeing. Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics are at about almost 8%. Raytheon is above 8%. L3Com is a little higher than 6 And then the smaller companies are actually pretty high, with the exception of Orbital. A smaller company can focus on a more niche business that's more profitable, whereas a larger company in order to sustain its revenue base, may have to focus on less profitable businesses. So typically, the larger the company is, the lower the profit margin will tend to be. Here is Northrop Grumman's annual profit margin. And you can see that before they spun off their shipbuilding business, they were hovering at around 5%. Now they're up close to 8%. And this is a big reason why they spun off shipbuilding. 
Lockheed Martin project, Lockheed Martin's annual profit peaked at about seven percent, and it's been hovering at around six until lately when it jumped up to six and a half. And here's Boeing, which hovers at about five percent. And here's how all three compare. So in this case, you can see that Northrop Grumman, in terms of profit margin, is actually a more profitable company. Price earnings ratio is a way to compare corporate earnings divided by the share price or the market capitalization. This creates a normalized metric for that equates the stock price to, co to corporate performance. If I had a stock price of $100 per share and earnings of $5 per share, the P-E ratio is 100 divided by 5, or 20. If I had a stock that was $50 per share and earned the same $5 per share, the P-E ratio is 10. And if I had a stock that was $50 per share with $10 per share of earnings, the P-E ratio is 5. Computed as a return on investment, a P-E ratio of 20 equates to about a 5% return, whereas a P-E ratio of 10 equates to about a 10% return. A P-E ratio of 5 equates to a 20% return. So investors tend to want to invest in stocks that have low P-E ratios. If the price was $75 per share and the earnings were $5 per share, the P-E ratio is 15. If that same company, if their price share price goes up to $100 per share, it's good for the investors that invest the $75. But if the earnings remains at $5 per share, the P.E. is now 20. If that company stock price was flat and remained at $75 per share, but if they double their earnings, their P.E. ratio would be 7.5. So a P.E. of 15 equates to about a 6.66% return. A P.E. ratio of 20 equates to about a 5% return. And a P.E. ratio of 7.5 equates to a 13.3% return. So investors would favor a company with a 7.5 P.E. ratio. There's a, a greater chance for return. Northrop Grumman's annual average P.E. peaked at about 20 in the early 2000s, but lately it's been hovering around 10. Because of their recent stock price run up, the P.E. increased in 2013. A high P.E. indicates that the stock price is high as compared with um, the earnings that companies make. P.E.s go high typically when market conditions are favorable. All companies benefit from this. They also go high when investors believe the company is about to be really successful. There's a theory that a P.E. ratio will remain stable. If a company earns more P.E., if a company earns more, the P.E. will go down. People will then buy the stock because the low P.E. is attractive. That will drive the stock price up, which will bring the P.E. back to where it was. This is not always the case, however. Lockheed's Martin annual, annual average P.E. peaked at about 25, but lately has been a little over 10. And Boeing, they peaked at well above 35 in 1998 and around 35 in 2003 but they've been around 15 or 16. And here's how they compare. The blue line is the S&P average annual PE. And you can see in general, with the exception of Boeing, the aerospace companies Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, which are the blue and purple, were valued well below the market because they fell below this, this blue line. And they still are even in 2013. So what that indicates is the market doesn't value these aerospace companies as highly as they value the rest of the market. Here are the P-E ratios for all the major aerospace companies. And you can see by and large that they're around 16, maybe a little higher, with the exception of orbital sciences. Orbital sciences is smaller, and so investors probably think that there's more growth potential with orbital, hence the higher P-E. Rather than use profits to buy back stock, a company can give profits to its shareholders. This makes sense since the shareholders own the company. Profits that are dispersed to shareholders are called dividends. And here you can see Northrop Grumman's dividends. The bars are the actual dollar dividend paid, and the scale for that is the vertical axis on the left. The red line is the percentage dividend paid, and it's the dividend paid divided by the share price. So you can see Northrop Grumman 
was about a 3.5% dividend. But despite the fact that in 2013 they increased their dividend payout in terms of dollars, when the share price went up, the percentage dividend went down. Lockheed Martin also has been increasing dividends over time. And with their recent stock price run up, their dividend went down. But they're hovering at around 4%. And Boeing's dividends also have been going up, but their dividends, which were approaching 4%, are now at about 2%. And here's how all three compare. So if you're an owner of Boeing stock, you can expect about a 2% return based on dividends. If you own Northrop Grumman stock, you'll get somewhere between 25 and 3%. And if you own Lockheed, you'll get about four and a quarter percent dividend. And you can see all of these companies are increasing the dividend dollar payout over time and trying to hold the percentage dividend um, as high as reasonable. Investors who want dividends are a special kind of investor. And some companies don't pay dividends. They want to reinvest all their money either in buying back stock or in growing the company. In this case, these aerospace companies are trying to attract a certain kind of investor that wants a fixed return on their investment. And so they're keeping dividends relatively high and increasing them over the years. Here are the dividends that are paid out by the major aerospace companies. And you can see Lockheed Martin is the highest. B Aerospace and Orbital don't pay out dividends. And they're examples of companies that want to use their earnings to grow the business. Book value is the assets of a company minus the liabilities. I mentioned market cap is the price you'd have to pay to buy the company. Book value, if you were to shut the company down and sell off its assets, is the value you would get. Northrop Grumman book value, when they were doing shipbuilding, was about close to $18 billion. But when they sh spun off their shipbuilding business, it's around $10 billion. Lockheed Martin remarkably has extremely low book value. And it wasn't that in 2012 they had no assets. Is that the uh, In the book value equation, they also account for accounts payable and accounts receivable. And in this case, they must have had enough accounts receivable or they must have had enough accounts payable that it brought their book value down to zero. But they're around $5 billion. Boeing, is their book value increased recently around 14 billion prior to that they were about they were increasing steadily up to six billion dollars and here's how all three compare one of the things wall street likes is a company that can make a lot of earnings with very little assets lockheed martin has done brilliantly at this northrop grumman and spinning off their shipbuilding improved their book value quite significantly so wall street actually likes to see companies with low book value and high earnings it sounds counterintuitive, but it makes sense. And this is why Coca-Cola spun off their bottling business. That was a uh, very capital-intensive business with low margins, and they preferred to keep um, the formula for Coke and license it, which means they need less assets to do that. Here are the book values of the major aerospace companies. And you can see Lockheed Martin is extremely low. Depreciation is a measure of how much the value of capital is declining. Depreciation is typically about equal to capital spending with large companies like the ones we deal with. If your capital equipment is getting old, you have to continually replace it. And in order to replace it, you spend capital to do that. And so here's an example that shows that depreciation and capital spending are comparable. This is Northrop Grumman's depreciation and capital, um, capital spending and depreciation. And the capital spending is in the red, depreciation is in the blue. And you can see in 2013, they spent a little over $400 million on capital. This is the money that's required to maintain the equipment they need to do their business. And here's how all three companies compare. So Northrop Grumman and Lockheed are spending somewhere between 600 and 800 million on capital. Boeing, which is a much more capital intensive business, is spending 1.6 billion. And here's how all the aerospace companies compare. So this is the money that is spent for satellite development facilities, things like thermal vac chambers, um, for facilities. 
this is the funding that the government doesn't pay for that builds the infrastructure for these companies to do business. Now, by and large, these companies would rather have the government fund their capital, but in many cases, the government won't do that. So the companies spend their own money to build capital. And here's depreciation for the largest aerospace companies. So the last thing the company spends profits on is reinvestments in the company. Some of that is for capital. Much of the capital, however, is raised by borrowing money. And what one of the metrics Wall Street looks at is return on capital. So given the book value of assets, what's the net income that's produced? And you can see Lockheed Martin is, because they have such low book value, is well ahead of all the others. They get about a 28% return on investment. Boeing is pretty high as well. The other companies are at around 13 14%, and the smaller companies are even lower. So this is a metric that an average investor probably isn't much interested in, but institutional investors look at this pretty closely. So I mentioned that companies borrow money to pay for capital. They could issue stock to pay for capital. And when I mentioned how startups start up, they do issue stock for the specific purpose of paying for capital. But as I mentioned previously, companies want to reduce their number of shares outstanding. So in some cases, a company will issue more shares of stock to generate capital. But by and large, they'd rather borrow money to do that. And the long-term debt of these largest companies is around $5 billion for the biggest and lower for the smaller companies. United Technologies is carrying a significant amount of long-term debt, around $20 billion. And like shares outstanding, um, these aerospace companies are trying to decline long-term debt. If you reduce long-term debt, you reduce interest payments, which means you're more profitable. Now, in 2013, for some reason, Northrop Grumman had to borrow money. But you can see Lockheed Martin was declining pretty steadily, except in 2011 when they had to borrow money, but since they've been declining. And Boeing had a big increase in 2009, but since then had been declining pretty significantly. So Boeing's pretty, being pretty aggressive in reducing their long-term debt. And here's how the three companies compare. So those are all the factors that affect shareholder value. And to recap, they are stock price. Well, stock price is a function of the fundamentals of the company and market sentiment. Shares outstanding, however, those improve as a function of profits made. If a company earns profit, they can buy back shares. The market cap is a function of fundamentals and market sentiment. Net sales is a function of co corporate execution. Profits is obviously a function of profits. Price earnings ratio is a function of profits and share price. Dividends is a function of profits. Book value is a function of assets. Capital expenses and depreciation is a function of financial management. And return on capital is a function of profits. Long-term debt is a function of need, but paying off long-term debt is a function of profits. And you can see from this slide that profits are supremely important. It's a very important metric to a company. And this is why in order to influence these metrics favorably, a company needs to have pretty healthy profits. Now let's delve into how these companies make money. I'll use Northrop Grumman's income statement as an example. This information comes from their annual report, something they're required to publish yearly. None of it's proprietary. First, let's relate company sales, profit, and revenue to the typical contract structure. So in 2013, Northrop Grumman had $24,661,000,000 in net sales. That broke down into $5,379,000,000 of gross profit and $19,282,000,000 of operating expenses. Of the net sales, $21,278,000,000 was U.S. government contracts, 3.3 or 3. almost $3.4 billion was either commercial or foreign sales. And Almost $13 billion was accounted for with cost plus contracts. $11.662 billion was for fixed price contracts. In a firm fixed price contract structure, the profit earned contributes to gross profits. Likewise, in a cost plus contract structure, the profit or fee 
also contributes to gross profits. The cost on a firm fixed price contract is what contributes to operating expenses, and likewise on a cost plus contract, those costs are accounted for as operating expenses. So, as I said, Northrop Grumman had $24.6 billion in net sales, five point, almost $5.4 billion in gross profit, and $19.3 billion in operating expenses. Let's delve into gross profit. Of the $5,379,000,000 of gross profits, $2.256 billion were general and administrative expenses at the corporate level, and these were paid out of profits. So these were depreciation and amortization, executive compensation, pension expense, rent, and other things. The remaining profit is called operating income, and it was $3.123 billion. That breaks down into $2.863 billion in income before taxes. Nothel Grumman paid $257 million in interest, and had $3 billion of other expenses. The net income was $1.952 billion. There was $13 million of extraordinary items. And what these are are non-recurring events like the sale of a company or some other expense that is not expected to recur. It's reported this way so investors know that these are not recurring expenses or recurring income. And Northrop Grumman paid $911 million in income taxes. There was also a pension adjustment in 2013 that added $1.79 billion to Northrop Grumman's profit. In the prior two years, um, this adjustment accounted for a loss against profits. So the net income was $1.965 billion. The pension adjustment was $1.79 billion. That equated to a comprehensive income of $3.755 billion. Now, on typical cost plus contracts, especially if they're big ones, the potential fee is usually set at 15%. If a company is a second tier supplier, it's lower, typically 13% or maybe 12%. But let's assume that the target fee on contracts like North of Grumman or Lockheed Martin holds is 15%. In a portfolio of programs, the actual fee earned is going to tend to be about half that. If a company does well on all their contracts, they could earn 50% across the board. But typically, they have some that do well, some that don't do well, and they earn about half. If you account for all the corporate expenses of the original 15% target fee, these companies are earning only about 2.65% profit on these contracts. Now, it's not to say that this is a hardship. Um, these companies are very profitable. They do very well. But um, you should know that of the fee awarded, only about half that is actually getting reported as profits. On a firm fixed price contract, it's different. If they keep expenses low, they'll earn profit. And that too contributes to net in income. So that sums it up for shareholder value. So who runs these companies? The big three are run by Boeing is James McNerney. He's the chairman and chief executive officer, so he holds two of the titles that I described. Lockheed Martin is run by Marilyn Hewison. She's the chairman, president, and chief executive officer. And Northrop Grumman is run by Wes Bush, who's the chairman, chief executive officer, and president. Number of employees in these companies. Um, Boeing has about 160,000. United Technology is well over 200,000. Uh, Lockheed Martin over 100,000. And then GD Northrop Grumman is around 60 or 70,000 as is Raytheon. So quite a few employees in each of these large companies. All right, so next I want to break down the revenue that a company earns. And that starts with net sales. Again, net sales is broken down into gross profit, but I want to talk about the cost of revenue. And actually, instead of cost of revenue, we'll refer to the red line as operating expenses. 
So the fundamental expense these companies incur is labor. And labor is comprised of program management, systems engineering, uh, people who build the spacecraft bus, people who um, build and design the payload, and then assembly and test. On top of labor is payroll expense. Payroll expense is composed of payroll taxes, group insurance, uh, some pension contribution, 401 savings contributions, uh, funding for vacation, holiday, sick leave. Some companies do pay an employee bonus, not all do, and then there's other expenses. On top of payroll expenses is overhead. And overhead is comprised of office space, some depreciation, human resources, facilities, training, and functional management. Uh, there are other direct costs on contracts. Likewise, there's procurement costs. Um, there are subcontracts. And then on top of that is general and administrative costs. Now, these are separate from the corporate level, general and administrative costs. GNA costs include um, internal research and development funding, bid and proposal funding, corporate expenses, insurance, legal. The corporate expense is a contribution to corporate that um, – each of these sectors has to pay. And then uh, director level bonuses come out of GNA. So internal research and development is funding that the government allows to be charged to contracts that companies can use at their discretion to develop new technologies that would potentially benefit the government. The government has to approve internal research and development, but approval is usually pretty tacit. Um, bid and proposal is funding that the government can include in GNA that companies use to write competitive proposals to win new business. And they're allowed to build this as part of their GNA rate structure. And then what's last is material. This is the cost of raw material used to build, in our case, satellites. And then on top of that, which I said is separate, is fee and profit, and that equates with gross profit on the income statement. Subcontractors will also have their own rate structures. So you'll see little mini rate structures within subcontractors. And in this case, general and administrative costs are applied to subcontracts as well as to labor. So if you look at the breakdown of labor, uh, typically 6 to 18% of the labor on a program is assembly and test. 18 to 30% is spacecraft bus design. 35 to 58% is payload design. 5 to 15% is system engineering. And 4 to 7% is program management. That equates for all the labor expense on a program. And let's say that um, labor, this labor accounts for 100%. We then in add a payroll expense, which is typically about 40%. That takes those raw labor costs and multiplies them by 1.4. Overhead um, typically had been 80%. Overhead rates have been coming down recently. But assume 80%. That takes the raw labor costs, which were multiplied by 1.4 for payroll expense, and now multiplies them by 2.52. A typical GNA is 18%. That now takes labor and multiplies it by 2.97. If you add a 7% fee, labor is now multiplied by 3.18. This is why when you look at salaries and equate it with the cost incurred on a contract, there's a pretty big multiplier. And in reality, you've got to pay payroll expense to keep employees employed. You've got to have overhead to support employees and programs. And you've got to have GNA to support the company. So these costs are required. Um, if you look at the actual assembly and test costs, the real touch labor on these programs, it's about 1.8 to 5.6% of rolled up costs. So what this says is we're in a very overhead intensive business, both in terms of the raw labor, which needs program management and system engineering, as well as the other overhead expenses that are applied along the way. In subcontracts, um, they will have their own escalation, and the multiplier may not be 3.18%, but for comparative, persons, comparative purposes, let's assume it's 3.18 as a multiplier. A prime would then apply their GNA, which 
makes the subcontractors multiplier 3.75 and they apply their fee. The fee is spread over the entire base of the contract. So the multiplier for a subcontract is about four. This is why companies only subcontract if the subcontractor provides some value that the prime contractor can't provide. Otherwise, it would be less expensive for the prime contractor to provide that own that, that um, good or service that would otherwise be subcontracted. All right, a different rate structure, which has no GNA applied to subcontracts would reduce the cost, the net cost of subcontracts. Now there's only a 3.18 multiplier. But in order to do that, the contractor is going to have to increase their GNA expenses. So even though uh, GNA is not applied to subcontracts in this case, the prime contractor typically is going to have very similar GNA expenses, which just means a higher GNA rate is applied to labor. And so now the labor multiplier goes up to 3.15. And at the top level is 3.37. And neither of these rate structures is, one isn't better over the other. They're just different. And here, um, the subcontractor labor escalation is now 3.4. So programs typically go in life cycles like this. In order to sustain a steady business, companies need a portfolio of programs with a few starting, a few in the middle, and a few finishing. Otherwise, they'd have trouble retaining employees. So this graph on the bottom is an attempt to depict a typical program profile. Companies have to estimate rates that go out five to seven years. If they're going to plan existing projects and bid on proposals, they need to have both labor rates as well as overhead and GNA rates estimated. Otherwise, you couldn't predict future costs. A change in overhead and GNA affects everything in the rate pool. If you're a program manager who is on target, a rate increase could cause your program to overrun if the rate increase went up. If you're a proposal manager trying to compete, high rates can make you more expensive than your competitor. So these rates are managed very carefully um, and they're reassessed continuously. So let's say we had a portfolio of programs within a company project A through F, they were staffed by a number of functional areas, and these are typical functional areas. And let's say that we had a program cancellation. All the labor on that program would immediately charge to overhead if they don't have a project to charge to. Now, what a company will try to do is reallocate those people to project A through E, but let's say hypothetically they couldn't. So all those people would charge directly to overhead. In this rate structure, what that would do is it would take people that were originally charging to labor and to labor and actually earning overhead in GNA. It would move them out of the base labor pool, which would increase overhead by 90% and GNA it would increase to 20% because the labor base is decreased. And it actually would move all those employees' labor charges into overhead, which increases overhead now to 100%. GNA ironically goes down because the, the overhead is part of the base for GNA. But this company, by losing that program, has now seen a significant increase in overhead, which they can't withstand. And what they will do is they will lay those people off if they can't find project work for them. That increases overhead to 90%, but overhead rates are still higher than they were. Uh, it increases GNA to 19.5%. And so these companies will find an additional 10% of overhead they can lay off and lay that off to bring their rates back down to where they were. And they have to do this in order to maintain cost performance on programs and in order to stay competitive. So something else companies do is try to grow their business. Um, a program profile like this actually would mean a company would have to lay off people when this curve dipped. What they try to do is sustain it, but even better what they try to do is grow the business. Companies follow a fairly consistent process in pursuing new business. If the government funds early studies and starts to conceive a program, companies will hold an interest gate. And here they'll decide whether to spend marketing funds, which are paid for out of overhead, to pursue this opportunity. If 
the government program matures into a phase A study, companies will hold a pursuit gate, and here they will assess whether the program is going to actually get funded by the government. That's the PGO, the odds that an opportunity will be funded, and a P win, which is the company's own assessment of their probability of winning. They allocate funding <clears throat> based on the product of the PGO times the P win. An opportunity that has a higher product of PGO times P win will get more funding than an opportunity that has lower PGO times P win. So if they pass the pursue gate, they will fund a capture phase. And there's <clears throat> pretty significant funding allocated to phases like this. This is typically paid out of IR&D funding and could be paid out of overhead. If the program matures into a phase B study, companies continue in the capture phase, but when an RFP is released, companies will hold a bid no bid review. And here, they're determining whether they're going to fund a proposal effort, which is paid for out of BNP. If they do decide to write a proposal and spend BNP to do that, they will submit the proposal, the government evaluates, they do a source selection. If the company wins, they negotiate. Negotiations are also paid for out of BNP, although it's pretty minimal. And if awarded, the company will now execute the program. And here, they're incurring direct costs and can charge the government directly for the work they do. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, overhead is paid out of overhead. IRD is paid out of general administrative. BNP is out, paid out of GNA. And then direct is paid for directly out of the labor pool. If a company has contracts that aren't performing well and they lose all of their profit and fee, which happens, they're still able to bill over, overhead and they're still able to bill GNA, which means they have money to pay for marketing, they have money to pay for capture, and they have money to pay for proposals. So well. Contracts that don't earn a profit are bad. It's not all bad for these companies. <clears throat> when proposals are written, and it starts years ahead of time for those who are good at this, a company must plan the program in detail and estimate costs. So again, this is a typical profile. When a company writes a proposal, they would expect costs to be in line with a profile like this. While program costs do not fit a normal distribution, Companies use this to assess risk. And what they're doing here is they're saying, if I bid this program very high, my odds of execution are going to be nearly 100%. If I'm more aggressive and I bid this lower, what the x-axis says is my odds of execution are going to be lower, which means I've got a risk that I might overrun. And if I get very aggressive, I'll bid this very, very low, but my odds of overrunning are going to be very, very high. Companies typically like to be in this 80% to 50% range. And again, this is an assessment they do. But lately, if they feel like they can't be competitive um, and that a competitive bid would be too risky for them, they won't bid on the contract. <clears throat> so when proposals are written, um, costs are estimated and then they're negotiated, and then they're allocated. The estimated proposed costs are higher. When contracts are negotiated, um, usually the target cost is reduced. And then when funds are allocated to performing organizations, program management will hold back funding so that they have a management reserve. So the person who wrote the original estimate will have estimated one value. Um, to do the work, and they have to do an estimate that they will sign up to, and it's got to be reasonable and um, ethical. But over time, what they estimated will be eroded, and they'll actually be expected to perform the work for less money than they had originally estimated. And it could be a 20 to 30 percent reduction. Everybody in these companies who performs work understands this, they know they're going to get challenged. And they don't necessarily pad their bid, but they make sure that one way or another, they find a way to do the work for the money that, that is allocated. So I mentioned that companies that earn no fee are able to fund um, IRAD and BNP and can actually fund new business. Um, 
there's more to the impact of no fee as well, though. If a company's earning no fee, they still can bill for overhead, and that will pay for um, some of their labor. That'll pay for depreciation, office space. So they're able to cover these expenses. And likewise, with GNA, they not only can fund BNP and IRD, they're still able, still able, ironically, to pay bonuses, corporate expenses, and labor allocated to GNA. So this is why sometimes on programs that are not earning any fee, you'll hear about people earning bonuses because they're paid for out of GNA, which is, the company is still able to bill for. All right, so um, now I want to talk about the corporate structure at lower levels. And these are the people on these contracts that we're typically dealing with directly. So it starts with the president and vice presidents who have responsibility for profit, loss, and sales. Um, they have good insight into what drives shareholder value. These are people that probably hope to be the CEO someday. And if not, um, are interacting pretty closely with the CEO. Um, but they're not accountable to shareholders directly. And they're kind of the buffer between shareholder-driven, uh, shareholder value-driven motivations and uh, employee-driven motivations at the lower level. At the next level is director and managers. They're really more focused with unit performance and group performance. These people um, can be incredibly busy and they're really focused on doing their job. They have less insight into what drives shareholder value and less shareholder value motivations. And at the bottom are employees that are more focused on individual performance and may have some insight into what drives shareholder value, but not so much as the people on the top of the org chart. So the way these people are compensated can give you some insight into what motivates them. Uh, the people at the higher level earn bonus and a salary and usually get stock, and they're typically paid out of profits. So if profits increase, there's more money to compensate them. Uh, VPs also get a salary and a bonus and stock and are paid out of profit. Um, directors, however, they'll get a salary and a bonus. Um, their salary is usually paid for directly on contracts. The bonus is paid for out of GNA. So while they may have insight into what drives shareholder value, their compensation is not so much at risk based on things like profit and other metrics the shareholders value. Managers may possibly get a small bonus. Some companies do this, some don't. Their bonuses are also paid out of GNA, and employees may get a small bonus which would be paid out of GNA as well. So by and large, people at the bottom of the org chart, because they're not compensated based on things that drive shareholder value, tend not to have as much shareholder focus. And the bonuses that are paid at the higher level are usually based on how profitable the company is and how much they grow their sales and revenue. But at the lower level, compensation is typically more about employee retention than it is about rewarding performance based on shareholder metrics. That's why many of the people that we deal with really aren't motivated by what motivates people at the higher levels. So a takeaway. Um, DirecTV is a great case study that illustrates how shareholder value can drive decisions at the highest levels. So the original Hughes Electronics Corporation was owned by GM and it was comprised of Hughes Communication Inc., an entity that um, acquired satellites and leased them. Hughes Space and Communications developed satellites. Hughes Electro Optical developed payloads for satellites. Delco was the technology arm of GM. Hughes Network Systems had a, um, a satellite leasing business of their own, and then DirecTV. And these are the major components of Hughes Electronics. Well, initially, um, Hughes Communications, Inc. Uh, had a lot of value for the company, and they spun it off and sold it to Pan AmSat. So this was the beginning of the spinoffs of Hughes Electronics. And then, um, because DirecTV was doing so well and was driving the stock price so significantly, the executives at Hughes Electronics decided they wanted Hughes Electronics to be more of a pure DirecTV play, and they wanted to divest themselves of a pretty massive aerospace business. So they sold Hughes Space and Communications to Boeing. They sold Hughes Electro-Optical to Raytheon, and they gave Delco back to GM. 
Um, this was tens of thousands of, employee, of employees. Um, the size of Hughes Electronics at the time as an aerospace company rivaled the business, biggest aerospace companies that we deal with today. Um, it was formidable and included both satellite manufacturing and payload manufacturing. But at the time, it made more sense to spin these off. And so they did spin them off. Later, Hughes Network Systems was spun off to Echostar. And what remained of Hughes Electronics, the old Hughes Aircraft Company, was purely DirecTV. And the reason behind this was because of DirecTV's phenomenal growth. DirecTV started in 1996, but at about 2005, they earned a profit. And you can see from this graph, the revenue lines, the blue lines, they added about a billion dollars a year of revenue and even more later on. And profits, which is the scale on the right, increased significantly. So even though they had a crown jewel of an aerospace company, it made more sense for them to spin off those less profitable parts so that investors could enjoy the benefits of a pure play of a stock that was solely direct TV. So we would like to think that companies are customer focused and employee focused and less shareholder focused. But in reality, um, given the significant drivers and given the fact that shareholders own these companies, they have to be shareholder focused first, customer focused second, and employee focus third. Companies who are not shareholder focus um, don't do well, their valuations decline, and they're ultimately gonna get acquired by some entity that's gonna put in new management who will, will be shareholder focused. So even if you're a company who's not shareholder focused, um, you will be someday. So this guy, our commander in chief and chief executive favors capitalism. And as I said, years ago, somebody made the decision to outsource much of the work that we do to the private sector. Um, they build the complex satellite systems that we operate. Um, outsourcing, as I mentioned, helps bolster our capitalistic sector. And it was a decision that was made a while ago. I think that the relationship we have with corporate companies is extremely good. But hopefully, this has given you some insight into why their motives are not always mission focus as ours are.